Good afternoon, or really good evening, folks. Uh, thanks for joining us today on this almost last minute live stream, which was only planned uh, just a few days ago. But the purpose uh, of this really is to uh, talk about a trip which I'm going to be going on with one of our ambassadors, Paul Reefer, next week. Uh, probably answer the important question uh, why uh, we're actually going on this trip, um, not just for fun. Um, and talk about the kit we're using and a few other considerations, which hopefully will also be useful information uh, for you guys and girls if you're planning to do uh, your own kind, own kind of trip, which is focusing on photography. Uh, the reason for all this mess behind me as well uh, will also come to play in a second. So let's uh, go and find Paul. Hey, Paul, how's it going? Oh, yeah. I'm good. Good, good. So you're coming through loud and clear, which is nice. For those of you which who don't know Paul, um, I'm sure you do by now, I would hope. But if not, uh, Paul is one of our Capture One ambassadors, have been for a number of years now, I guess. And we yep. haven't haven't kicked you out yet. Um, <laughs> uh, just give us the 30 second rundown of who you are and what you do, Paul, just for the benefit of any newcomers. Um, so I am, well, as you say, I'm one of uh, Capture One's ambassadors. Um, so I'm also one of Phase One's ambassadors. So I use their big cameras um, and we shoot travel, landscape, cityscape stuff, um, whether that's for commercial um, or prints, but one way or the other, um, I go out around the world and can again now, which is exciting, um, go out around the world and shoot big pictures, big landscapes, big cityscapes um, for production on a large scale um, in terms of output. Excellent. Cool. Oh, wrong button, David. There we go. Um, so for some time, Paul and I have been talking about doing some kind of, of trip. Um, well, we've done a couple. We had a, a wet caravan experience <laughs> last November uh, when we were talking about launching uh, pano stitching uh, for Capture One. And we were supposed to go live from the coast, but we got wet and went live from a caravan instead. Um, but in actual fact, it, it worked out fine. Uh, and it was quite nice to show the reality of actually trying to uh, work as a photographer in the environment, uh, which we're going to talk about uh, in a second as well. Uh, so we thought about, well, let's do another trip. Um, and there's a few reasons of why we would need to do such a trip. So if I bring up this little presentation, uh, I guess one of the primary reasons is uh, to talk about this guy at the bottom, uh, which is Capture One for iPad, uh, which I would hope you've heard about it uh, by now, um, but it's been in beta testing for a while. Uh, we're not that far off, I would hope, for a, an actual release. And actually going somewhere on location uh, we'll be able to put that uh, through its paces and a little bit more on that in a second. And probably also, more importantly than anything, Capture One as a company needs content, right? So we have our YouTube channel, we have our Instagram uh, page, of course, we have Facebook. Um, no doubt other channels will spring up in the future. And of course, to keep uh, you ladies and gentlemen interested and engaged in what we're doing, then we obviously have to keep that um, up to date and full of content. Uh, content doesn't last very long, unfortunately. Uh, so that's that's one of the, the small reasons. Um, and of course, I could just go somewhere, get in the car and drive and shoot pictures, but obviously I'm not experienced like uh, this person above and definitely uh, uh, driving <laughs> driving yes i could drive uh year round places uh, but yes i can take pictures uh but of course uh the expertise in this really is down to where to go what to see time of day and all that kind of stuff so speaking of time of day before we get to that uh, there's also another reason that we want to uh, gather some nice imagery. This is a corner of our lovely office in Copenhagen. This is one of the, the hot desks. You probably can't read the sign, but it says uh, free desk. Now, not every corner of the office looks like this, but this one is a little bit on the sad side because the walls are bare. And for a photography company, it would be nice if we could uh, cover these walls with something a little bit uh, more interesting. So we also helped to gather some decent large format images as well from Paul. Uh, to show exactly what uh, Capture One can do. And in terms of why go, where and when, uh, Paul drew this lovely graph for me. It's a happiness graph. A happiness graph, exactly, <laughs> which I will let him uh, explain rather than me. I guess what it was, but uh, maybe in the comments, if you can guess what it is very quickly, 
uh, oh, then, <laughs> then you might get a prize. But Paul, there's a clue. There's a clue in the middle in words. Clue in the middle, um, exactly. So effectively, there are I mean, obviously places like Iceland and, and anywhere um, Nordic and equally anywhere sort of in the southern latitudes as well is is stunning in general because you get extremes of, of season. Mm-hmm. Um, and those seasons result in very different weather. So, of course, you've got snowy season, and icy season. Then you've got the very green season that Iceland is. You know, the mm-hmm. Greenland Iceland debate goes on forever. But, um, you know, in the summer, Iceland becomes very lush, very green, apart from where the, um, the glaciers remain. Um, but that's just the weather side of thing. What we're not talking about there is light. So in the winter, great place to go and see the Northern Lights as long as you get a, a break in the weather, mm-hmm. because it tends to get dark very early and stay dark until very late. Um, so you can you know, pop out, see the Northern Lights, go get some dinner, go to a bar and then go to bed. Mm-hmm. Um, rather than the sort of hunting through the 1am, 2am um, sort of windows. But the flip side is true in the summer. So in the summer, useless for the Northern Lights because you can't see it. And the reason you can't see it is because it is pretty much permanently light. So mm-hmm. the further north we go, obviously, and, and the reverse in the in the Southern Hemisphere for, for sort of winter versus summer, um, as we get up to those higher latitudes, we start hitting the point of midnight sun. Technically, Iceland isn't a true midnight sun place because the sun does dip just below the horizon in theory. Mm-hmm. In practice, it is never dark during the period of time that we're there. So the sun will go up to about 47 degrees um, in the daytime. So about one o'clock is its sort of peak. Mm-hmm. Um, slowly, slowly curve down. And then this magic time that we refer to as golden hour, which is typically sort of half an hour before and half an hour after sunset, or sunrise in, in reverse, um, for us is going to last for six and a half hours. Nice. So instead of one hour's worth of sunset and one hour's worth of sunrise, we're going to get six and a half hours worth of time to you know fix any screw ups, basically. <laughs> um, so we can make sure well, that we get a really way cool. It. <laughs> yeah, we can we can get some really cool golden hour shots. Now that's wonderful in terms of quality of light, in terms of the angle of the light hitting things, you no know, shadows going on for miles. Mm-hmm. There is one downside, which is unfortunately that magic golden hour starts at 10 p.m. and finishes at 4:30 in the morning, mm-hmm. um, and that's what that fun little graph is. Yeah. So that graph is the inverse graph of David Grover's amount of sleep that he's going to get. <laughs> I was just about to say going in the winter sounds a bit more fun, actually. Um, <laughs> but there we go. And dur- during those six and a half hours, um, does the light change or is it like pretty constant? It, it no. does. So um, you've actually, well, you've also got, remember, the sun is moving. So physically, um, the, the position of the sun is going to change. So you're going to get movement in the sh- or the shadow positions when the sun is above the horizon. Mm-hmm. The sun's going to dip. You, may, you might just see the crest of it because at you know, 0.3 of a degree measured from the middle of the sun, you've still got some of the sun just sort of peeking up um, and, and cheating over the top. Mm-hmm. Um, but what you'll see is the sun sort of moves. So there's the famous shots like Kirk Jafel, um, You'll, you'll actually, in the midnight sun, you'll see the sun um, almost, it seems like it's moving almost horizontally. It's sort of coming across, hides behind the mountain, and then right. pops out the other side. Weird. So the whole time that's going on, you've got pure golden hour. You've got that golden sunlight. You've got you know reds and oranges and yellows and stuff going on. And all the only change is the position of the sun. And that's what we then play with composition with. So much less of a rush to get the shot yeah. as well. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's, uh, you know, if you're willing to sacrifice sleep, it's a <laughs> lazy way of getting a good golden hour option. And, and, and actually, to the well, to the point of you, you, most people have been in the golden hour at some point where they're mm-hmm. like, ah, oh, if only I was stood over there. But yeah. there's only a half an hour window. Well, yes. okay, let's go stand over there because we've got time to go and do it. Yeah, nice. Um, Barbers of Warwick asks, oh, that's very small. Let's make that bigger so we can read it. Uh, Paul, was this all worked out using photo pills? For those that no. who don't know, it's a, um, um, calc- and I guess, a photographer's companion for calculating yeah. astral and um, light and so on. Photo pills is a great yeah. app. Um, I, I, I do use it. Um, in this case, we've been running with TPE, um, so the, photogra- the Photographer's, photographer's. Ephemeris, um, which is the really long 
complicated um, app name. TPE is easier. Um, but they that and photo pills and many others do a very similar job of predicting where you're stood, uh, what the sun's going to do, what its mm-hmm. what its position's going to do over time. Um, and, and most of them now have AR functions as well. So photo pills is, is great for its AR. Um, you can sort of hold up and just make sure where the sun is heading to um, and when it's going to pop out again. Um, but yeah, there are lots of apps. Photo pills is one, TPE is another. There are others out there, um, but they all will help you with planning. Um, there is another one called Photo Transit, which is made by the same people that do TPE. Mm-hmm. And Photo Transit actually allows you to load in your lenses and it will show you where are you stood, where are you pointing at, and what your field of view will be and where the sun will be in it, which is kind of handy. Handy? Um, yeah. <laughs> Very handy. So, yeah. Cool. Well, let's move on. I can't remember what the next picture is. Oh, yeah, locations. This, <laughs> uh, this is Iceland, um, a few might have, have guessed. And, of course, Iceland, are, I guess you can say, Paul, is a very popular destination uh, for yep. photographers and for um, um, tourists. Oh, tourists, and the like. yeah. Yeah, actually, I don't know, um, which, I don't know which if this is, is going to work. This is, hang on, let me, let me just switch to solo cam. This is me 32 years ago with my mum. So there we go. <laughs> cool. So, a pi- pioneer in uh, Iceland. So so popular place, but certainly, at least when I went those years ago, it wasn't as popular. But now, of course, I'm sure we all know some of the most popular sites uh, around Iceland. And we wanted to hit some of those sites, but we also wanted to hit some of the ones which were less common and some of these like you've been to iceland i guess more than once (laughs) yeah yeah quite a few times Um, which is why Mm. when we started the conversation we agreed i think that we're going to head directly northeast yes up to that that lot there Um, the the blue dots yeah the well the pink dots pink dots sorry yeah Yeah. Yeah. um but um unfortunately i got overruled yeah. <laughs> and we're heading directly southwest to where there are more people. Great. <laughs> exactly. Well, it kind of worked out that way, I suppose, because we, we, we have a limited amount of, of time, obviously, for, you know, it'd be nice to spend all the money in the world. But but there's, of course, always a budget that, that we have to work to. Yeah. Um, and going over to the, the northwest uh, does obviously take more time. There's only, what, one road Right, Paul, which... which There's the one main road called Road 1. Road um, 1. Which, but I mean, there there are obviously lots of other ones um, that go off of it. But essentially, Iceland is, in general, for those that haven't been there, there's one great big ring road that that will take you around the whole of the island. You can get from one side to the other in about eight and a bit hours of driving, sort of from Reykjavik across to the northeast. Um, But you are, you know, and and actually the problem with photographers, we don't don't drive straight there. We stop. Stop. And we stop and we stop. Yeah. Um, so after losing a day and a half, you're then in the place of, well, actually, do we have enough here or are we going to end up driving back again to shoot other places? Yeah. So, yeah, we're uh, we're going to stick in three centers in the south, um, mm-hmm. in the west and in the northwest. Yeah. And some of those locations, I think, will be recognizable and some will be less common, I would say, a bit yep. more Absolutely. Off, off the beaten track. Um, and when it comes to that, like there, there was also the, in terms of hotels, like do we drive somewhere every day and stop and drive and stop and so on? Or yeah, well, yeah. We um, <laughs> I, I when when we're running workshops, um, mm-hmm. I, I I love the enthusiasm that um, people that are fresh to big road trips have for packing and unpacking every day. Um, and then on day three of packing and unpacking and they're broken, I point out their enthusiasm was maybe a little bit um, misguided. Yeah, it's so fun packing and unpacking. it's essentially, yes, you can be in the car and you can continue, you can do a camper van, you can do hotel to hotel to hotel. Mm-hmm. Um, but when you're there with a load of photo kit and um, more than one or two people, there's going to be more than just David and I um, around. Mm-hmm. And um, we're shooting through the middle of the night. Um, Mm -hmm. So if you think about it, the time that a hotel don't want you in there is sort of between 10 and 4. Yeah. um, Which is exactly when we're going to probably want to get some sleep. Yes. So (laughs) the idea of not having access to a hotel in those times isn't that attractive. So the trade-off is we know that by sort of hub and spoking, 
we're going to have extra driving because you're going to be based in in one location and then going out from it. Mm-hmm. But on the plus side, we've got time to charge things. <laughs> we've yeah. got time to sleep. You've got time to actually unpack things and, and get stuff dry if necessary and whatever else. So what I would say to people planning a road trip, especially with photography or, or even video in mind, is yes, the temptation is to just keep pushing into the next place, the next place, the next place. Sometimes it's worth having a base with a cluster of locations and even for things like weather. You know, if you're in one location or one one base and for two or three days the weather is changeable, great, you can wake up and you've got options. Mm-hmm. Whereas if, you know, you, there's nothing worse than you, you leave a place and then find out the weather was perfect the day that you left. That's true. Um, yeah. So yeah, there's lots of there are lots of benefits to keeping on moving. In this case, um, we're gonna we're gonna use three hubs. Yeah, and speaking of weather, it brings us or sorry, weather and roads. Well, yeah. I should say brings us to uh, don't use Google Maps section of the yeah. broadcast. I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah I, I think um, it. And again, it, it's a it's a challenge that we have. You know, Google and others, you know, other search engines are available. Mm-hmm. Um, but but Google has made life very um, easy to plan remotely. So we can yep. use 3D maps to explore landscapes. We can look at traffic conditions and road conditions that are reported to Google. And Google has great traffic sources. Mm-hmm. But there's nothing that beats the local sources for information. So in Iceland, there's loads of this stuff. You know, it, it, Iceland can be a really brutal place, um, mm. not only in terms of you know, the, the weather in terms of people getting exposed to it, but also, you know, cars do slide off of icy roads. Um, there are a lot of um, highland roads and stuff like that um, up in the mountains in Iceland. And you can see on that map, you know, that was mm-hmm. screen printed, I think, yesterday. Still, a lot of the road network is closed off because it's it's just not open yet for the, the sort of spring summer season. It's still too dangerous to pass across. Which would be pretty disappointing if you put your set on exactly. going to XX location and then yeah. did, couldn't get So there. I you know genuinely use those um, use those resources. If you don't know which resources to go to, go to the hire car companies. You don't have to rent their cars, but their yeah. websites generally will list um, resources for where to find out about road conditions, where to find out about weather conditions, and whatever, because they don't want their car yeah, totally. Please either. don't trash my car. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and speaking of weather, the, uh, yeah. the th- thrilling website of the Icelandic Met Office. Yeah. So veder.is, um, mm-hmm. so V D U R. Um, in my experience, ten, it, it, obviously long range forecasts don't don't really pan out um, in the same way, but they do give no. a trend. But certainly within about a 12-hour window, maybe 24-hour window, this for Iceland tends to be one of the most um, predi- or most accurate predictions of wind, but also um, I mean, we, we've got cloud cover on there as well. If you go in there to shoot the northern lights, um, it will help you with cloud cover because, frankly, northern lights are quite often going. They're going on now in theory. We just can't see them because it's too bright. Right, true. Um, what we need is a clear sky when it's dark. So one of those big elements is a clear sky. So cloud cover is useful. And you know, I've it's funny. I've sat in um, in one hotel up in the in the northeast looking at this before. Um, I think it was just before breakfast, and it showed that you know this this huge you know sixty kilometer seventy kilometer an hour wind was coming in. We look outside and it's like nah, it's perfectly <laughs> sure, fine. Not. Give it about two hours after breakfast blizzard pretty much um and we and we were in it so i found it to be relatively accurate i found the global sites you know the weather.coms the accuweathers and whatever they're great for trends again but on the ground you're not going to be again the local weather um Mm -hmm. sites and that's and and you can like sure we're talking about going to iceland which is you know kind of lofty in in some ways um but you can use this principle i guess whether you're going on holiday, whether you're shooting landscapes, whether you're yeah. going to go out and shoot portraits or whatever, then then uh, weather prediction is so much better now than it was, yeah. you know, even 10 years ago or whatever. I mean, and the so- data that you can get is mm. is so enriched now. So, you know, I live on the coast of the UK um, and most of the people that I know that live around here, we use Windy. So as an app yeah. called Windy, um, which for us here is a lot more useful because what we get battered with isn't, you know, rain and, and hail and whatever. We get battered with wind. And it's mm-hmm. useful to know that. And, and it tends to be more accurate than, you know, the general BBC forecast or whatever else. So I would I would ask the locals what they use. 
um, yeah. especially when you're talking about photography, because this stuff is the difference between you being able to stand there and take a shot or not. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, and wasting wasting a day. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's this is also the Icelandic Met Office cloud level, also important. Yeah. Yep. And as, as you said to me, you know, in the past few days and weeks, we want clouds. We don't actually want a clear blue sky. No, there's nothing more boring than a blue sky. Boring, really? Yeah. 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 Um, if you think about it, you know, golden hour, it's not golden if there's nothing for the light to bounce off of. Yeah. So we need vapor in the air. You know, you, you, well, sorry, you need something in the air. In some mm -hmm. places, that's pollution. In some yep. cases, it's it's water vapor. In some cases, it's you know solid ice up, up in the upper atmosphere. But mm -hmm. one way or another, we want to bounce that slow light around the place. Mm -hmm. So a solid blue sky is wonderful for exploring a country and hiking. Not so much for a really cool golden Taking hour pictures. shot. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, like the years ago when I went to Monument Valley, uh, the nicest picture I got was being or was. 30 seconds before being drenched by the rainstorm coming in through the, the desert. All the blue sky stuff is is kind of dull in comparison. Yeah. So, yeah, crappy, yeah, crappy weather for the wind, definitely. Um, oh, this is also a handy resource as well, which uh, yeah. I don't know if, if is prevalent in other countries. I guess probably anywhere where there's mountain passes and inaccessible so, roads, but this is very handy. Yeah, I mean, for, for roads, I mean, Iceland, when it comes to webcams and stuff like that, Iceland are on it. So yeah. if, if you're worried about is the road you know, accessible or open or whatever, and, and it's particularly in winter, um, you know, is, has it been, as a handy hint in Iceland in the winter, if you go to these webcams and you can't see the road, it hasn't been ploughed. Right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, in, in general, you know, this sort of thing is, it, it, you know, Iceland is, is pretty geared up for other, you mm -hmm. know, Norway has got some great networks of, of webcams as well. Um, some of the places up in, in Finland do as well. Um, but there's a wider point, which is what those, you know, we're talking about, you know, you can explore somewhere with Google 3D maps and stuff like that. That's wonderful. But what you can't see is conditions. Mm -hmm. So you've got a weather forecast on the one hand, you've got a 3D map on the other hand, and they're telling you what might happen and what did happen two years ago when the Google camera flew around. True. Yeah. It's not telling you now. Now, this is done, or this particular site is done for the road network. But think about it. If I wanted to see what the weather conditions are in Sydney right now, there are quite a lot of webcams pointing at the Sydney Opera House mm -hmm. from tourism information centers, from, from businesses, from restaurants, from whatever else. So, you know, a quick search around just to see, you know, webcams for whatever location, mm -hmm. it's going to save you a drive at best. It might even save you a flight in theory. That's true. Um, yeah. But at least you're prepared. You know what, what you're going into. And again, you're not going to find that just by looking at a weather.com or a map on Google. Mm, no, um, exactly. Um, okay, what do we got? Yes, hire cars, because this we're still, we're kind of <laughs> talking about or or progressing into talking about kit, of course, um, and your hire car is an important piece of kit. Maybe not if you're driving around beautifully paved roads in Northern France or something like that, but when it comes to Iceland and one of the locations which uh, we're going to, which I'm not gonna attempt to pronounce just yet, uh, the road is you know, noted as having you know, open rivers flowing across it, rocks, snow, you know, depending on the time of year and so on. Yeah, so, it's high clearance territory. Yeah, um, exactly. And, you know, so don't get me wrong, that, you know, it, it would be wonderful for us to have a um, very, very efficient um, high clearance 4x4 car. Yeah. In Iceland, they're, they're just not quite there yet. Um, now, one thing I would argue is the carbon footprint of the car that we're going to take is probably lower than the carbon footprint of the tow truck that has to go and get a Toyota Yaris out, out. of the gutter. <laughs> out of the ditch. So yeah, yeah, yes, we will, we will, um, we will make sure that all of that stuff is offset and all the right stuff. But mm -hmm. when it comes to choosing cars, you know, I genuinely, I see, I see it in the winter, especially up in the in the hills, nice and these little two wheel drive cars. Um, you know, even with snow tires, they're, they're going to struggle. Um, so just pick the right thing for you. And actually, there are a few things. So number one, when you go and shoot, you're going to have all your equipment. It's nice to have some space to lay that equipment out mm. undercover when you're when you're doing it, you know, getting getting out of a car that you've just managed to cram four people in. Um, <laughs> well, where, where's your kit going to be sorted out? Number two, if you can get a car with a tailgate that lifts up, 
So rather than the barn door tailgates, mm -hmm. the, the, the lift gate. Um, the reason being, if it is too windy to stand outside and shoot, you point your car into the wind and you stand underneath it. Mm -hmm. um, so all of those sort of things come with, frankly, a bigger car. But more importantly, um, yes, we are going up into a little bit of the highlands. Um, and when you do, there will still be bits of snow and ice on the road. There will still be rocks. And there will definitely be bits where we need a bit more high clearance than something on the floor. Yeah. And as you mentioned it with regards to the carbon offsetting, you know, that was that was a good point because there's also fair criticism, you know, well, it's kind of, you've got to fly there, you're going to be burning carbon to get there, you know, we need to rent a big car, all that kind of stuff, um, which, you know, you've ed educated me not only recently, but in the past about the importance of carbon offset. And then, of course, when you say that, often the response is, oh my God, that's going to be super expensive to buy back my CO2. Yeah. But in reality, for, for our trip and the, the site that you mentioned, uh, which I can't remember now, I was going to put a slide up about We'll put it, it in the I'm description sure. stuff. There, yeah. are, there, are, there are lots of them, but yeah, yeah it, it's it's not that much. And actually, no. I, well, I said to you I think yesterday, I wish um, governments would. So what, what I wouldn't recommend people do is just pay the guilt tax of a carbon offset country or company because... Mm -hmm. I, I in experience I've seen lots of them take the money and not do anything with it. Do anything with um, it. Or well, they'll they'll yeah. point out there's a project somewhere in a country you've never heard of and mm -hmm. you can never prove it. Um what I would do is keep things local. So I partner with a um a company called Creating Tomorrow's Forest. They are building wildlife habitats and trees and stuff like that in the UK near where I live in the next mm -hmm. county. Um and we'll literally buy trees by number. Yeah. Um, and, and put them in place. So I can literally say for X amount of bad stuff, we have bought X amount of good it's stuff treats. and I can I can show you where they are sort of. Yeah, thing. that's my tree. That, <laughs> yeah, that, exactly. Yeah. Um, and that just feels like a better way of doing it. And I, mm. I kind of wish that governments, rather than putting taxes onto air tickets, would actually put effectively trees onto yeah. air tickets or other, you know, it's not just trees. It's about having, you know, biodiversity in, in habitat, in, in, in lakes and building, mm -hmm. you know, building areas where bees could thrive and all the other stuff, you know, this, this thing about let's just keep planting trees. Well, that that's great, but there are other ways of, of doing this stuff. Um, and we just don't, you know, it's a little tick box at the end at the moment on an airline that says, do you want to just give us some extra money? Yeah. Do you want to carbon well, offset this? Yeah. 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 I'd, yeah. I'd rather it was a bit more, a bit local more and local yeah, and targeted but. definitely nice which okay. we're doing which we're doing so, yes yeah. um this wonderful <laughs> excel sheet uh, and you know hats off to paul here this is you know very little of actually zero of my input to be honest um of uh, uh the schedule based on of course if you remember at the start we spoke about the golden hour so of course it makes sense to shoot in the long golden hour and also there's less people around as well because the average sane person isn't going to wander around Iceland between 10 o'clock and 2 o'clock in the morning um, yeah yeah but because of that uh, it obviously requires a bit more planning uh, and you can see you know that's the full schedule on the left and then in the, the middle that I just zoomed in a little bit so you can see the kind of uh, so, uh, as I said the first Days two and three are the, let's call it the popular spots um, that yep. we're going to go to. So I can tell you now by broadcast three um, mm. with about four to five hours sleep a night and having done the more popular places, um, David yep. will be broken. <laughs> so I'll introduce broadcast three. Or three. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but no, I mean, it, it, it's, it sounds very simple. And actually in traditional... Um, trip for photography it's very easy because well it's not very yeah. easy but you've just got to think about where am i driving to typically in the day again going back to that point between hotels because that's dead time yeah uh, where am i going to shoot sunset we sleep overnight where am i going to get up to for sunrise and then rinse and repeat sort of thing yeah. in this scenario where our shooting time is overnight and our driving time is, is effectively after lunch, as it were, um, with, with sleep in between, things change a little bit. Because what I don't want to do as well is have anyone driving way too tired at three o'clock in the morning. No, because exactly. Yeah. Midnight sun sounds wonderful, but I can say from personal experience, if, you, if you've been driving from 10 p.m. to 5 a.m. in pure daylight and haven't seen darkness to sleep in, mm -hmm. it can get a bit tiring. Yes. So yeah. we, we are planning this stuff out to a to an hourly level so that we know who's doing what when um mm -hmm. and and having backups is the key bit yeah exactly 
And, oh, finally, speaking about broadcast, we'll talk about uh, nerdy kit in a second, but this uh, 4G map, you know, um, and also recently updated on YouTube. That's a great freeze frame I took of myself there. <laughs> um, I just added shortly before the broadcast, um, there's some placeholders here of um, the broadcast that we hope to do. So of course, what we would plan to do with you know the iPad, we can obviously use the iPad when we're on the road to import some photos, do a few quick selects, get them over to the cloud, depending on how good uh, Vodafone's network is. Uh, and then of course, when we're back at the base in the downtime, in between sleeping, eating, and so on, then we can pick them up on laptops, etc., and continue the editing process there. So those live sessions, whilst pretty well planned out, as you saw by Paul, there is a chance that we might be in a ditch or the reception isn't great or whatever reason. So, but we have Diego, who's uh, my, my colleague, um, my partner in, in the team we're in, and he'll also be adjusting those on the fly yeah. uh, if needs be as well. But that's that's at least the, the plan we hope for. The, well. the goal is in the same way as Dorset in the rain trodden caravan, we will try and broadcast where we can um, yeah. on that timetable. Bar something completely going wrong, we will broadcast even if there's nothing really to show you because, yeah, apparently seeing us two drowned with a couple of miserable beers was quite interesting. <laughs> apparently, <laughs> <laughs> so in terms of um kit, so we've got the kit car, we've also got uh cameras, of course. Paul, obviously, you're going to bring phase one, yep, uh, kit and so on. Uh, XT and it's bigger than yours. Exactly. Uh, yes, uh, we will take XF, and I'll, I'll tell you why. And um, there's a slight difference. So XT is a fantastic, epic landscape camera. Um, mm -hmm. Uses the 151 megapixel back, so wonderful stuff that comes with that. Um, and for the, the quality and sharpness of the lenses that we can put on there, it, it really can't be beat. However, with XF, uh, which is the more DSLR-like um, of, of the camera bodies and, and mm -hmm. the slightly bigger one. What I gain with that using the same digital back is things like automated focus stacking. Yeah. So when we want to play with subjects that are up close with massive, great big depth of field out into the background, that's where that comes into its own. So we'll be playing with both um, setups based on where we are. Cool. And then for me, uh, as Paul said, his is bigger than mine. I have borrowed a uh, Sony. This is an A7 IV. Uh, you might ask, well, why not an A7R4? Um, if you remember at the start, I said, some of the purpose of this trip is to get some raw files also that people watching can use also in educational material. There's been a long standing request like I'd love to follow on with uh, the same material that's been used yeah. in in whether that's a video or whether it's, you know, a written document or something like that. Some people prefer to, you know, follow along with that actual image. So if, you know, I shoot it in this case, then, you know, I'm more than happy to impart those lovely uh, raw files, but 33 megapixels, that's plenty for that, or at least I think this is 33 megapixels. And we'll, we'll share some so, from the phase one um, exactly. so we shots as well. It's just, yeah. in, in some cases, some people's kit is gonna struggle um, with editing some of those files. Yeah, exactly. And for educational purpose, the megapixels is irrelevant a lot of the time, because if we wanna show you how to do color editing or sharpening or adjustments or style brushes or all those things, Megapixels doesn't matter. It's more about the, okay. the technique. So I don't need to have 60, 70, 80 megapixels. Um, so that's what this. The downside to what David mm, does need to have is, yeah, gonna, is these. Ta da! Um, filters. <laughs> loads of them. <laughs> loads so, of these. Yeah. Um, with, with the phase one system, we have something called frame averaging, so automated frame averaging, which mm -hmm. effectively um, allows my camera to take sequences of shots and build them into one raw file in the camera. It gives mm -hmm. me a massive, great big dynamic range, so we get sort of 15 and a half or so stops of dynamic range. Mm -hmm. We don't have to worry about solid NDs, and we can get away sometimes with not even using graduated NDs uh, yeah, to do it. That's a great feature. But, the challenge is, um, for a lot of people, and most people with their cameras, um, mm -hmm. that's not the case. It doesn't have automatic frame averaging built in, um, simply because the camera doesn't have enough power inside it to, to be able to, to churn that data. Mm -hmm. So to control the light in the scene, we're going to be using quite a lot of filters, um, especially on, on David's kit. So mm -hmm. that's going to be either solid filters to 
reduce the light coming into the camera. So in other words, we can extend the exposure, exposure. time. That's how we get great big long moving clouds and, and wispy water. And, and, and this is very important when it comes to massive golden hours, balancing and hence this sort of um, filter um, balancing yep. the very, very bright part of the image with the very, very dark part of the image. Um, mm -hmm. You're going to have to clean this later. Uh, <laughs> um, with um, that, that bright and dark part so that we can get the entire frame within the dynamic range that the camera is capable of seeing. Mm -hmm. So typically a camera will see between 12 and 14 stops, depending on how good it is. Uh, the Sony is a very good camera in terms of its dynamic range capability, but mm -hmm. Unfortunately, the world isn't. The world isn't within 14 stops. It's a few stops more than that. So sometimes we just need to to bring that light in. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, and we'll talk about that when we will do some before and afters and actually show people, like some stuff can be recovered in Capture One without mm -hmm. a filter. Some stuff can't. Or more importantly, the recovery is much better yes. when you control yeah, exactly. the light coming in. Good, good data in, good, good data out, and so on. Um, Mr. Barber says, with such expensive kit, you take the majority on board with you. Have you invested in tough bags or cases? Well, hopefully for me, uh, or oh, you can't, hang on, let's just get rid of Paul a second. So you can see there is a, a, a rather hefty uh, F-stop bag just over my shoulder with a unit in the middle, which uh, I will attempt to, to take as carry on and I'm fairly confident it should be fine. I will so make it, it look it like depends it's on really the light. Yeah, exactly. It, it depends on the air. So some yeah. airlines are really stingy with it. They'll, they'll cap out at six mm -hmm. kilos or seven kilos at that point. There's not enough in your bag to be able to, to do it. Sorry, the, your bag is going to be over that. Yeah. That. Um, other airlines, so you know, I'm not going to name them because you, you can work them out yourselves. But other airlines will allow, in fact, in some cases, up to 23 kilos of, of cabin baggage. Um, yeah. There are times when I have checked in my Phase One kit into a Peli case, um, mm -hmm. and I remember starting to breathe when we landed. Yeah. Um, and it and it was in one piece, but yeah. you know, in in general, you know, these things are pretty tough. If you put them in a very well designed and built case with padding, yeah, you know, the case is designed. This is the other thing: the case is designed to break so that your kit doesn't. Yeah. People get very precious about their cases. Don't get precious about the case. Get precious about the contents. Yeah. Um, so yes, it is possible to check it in, but if on any possible way you can take it on board with you, I would. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Just, just so you know, it's still with you as well, more yeah. than anything. You know, in my former job as a lazy camera salesman, I would always check a big Peli box into oh. the hold, and uh, and I never had any issue whatsoever. So but what you do been... have now in 2022 yeah. oh. are these bad boys, Air Tags. Yeah, exactly. So one of the most Stick useful things in. for paranoia in the yes. world <laughs> are put one of these inside your case for the sake of 25 quid or whatever they are, 20 quid each. Yeah. Um, even if it does get lost, it's just a peace of mind thing. I know where it is. Yeah, um, exactly. As a result. Yeah, cool. Um, I think... That was pretty much everything uh, on the to-do list to, to talk about. But as I said, we're um, we're going to be broadcasting, fingers crossed, next week. Uh, so do come along and join. And as Ben says, and Ben, you're very kind, must have been eight years old, a bit older than that, unfortunately. So <laughs> top marks for, for, for Ben. But as Ben says, hit I'm amazed button. it was in colour. I know exactly, and and uh, not you know some kind of eight millimeter black and white or something like that. Um, but to be reminded of when we're live, uh, you can also hit the subscribe button and importantly the little bell because that means um, you'll get a reminder when we go live, like a notification. Especially if you've got the app on your phone, tablet, or whatever, uh, then you'll be reminded straight away. <laughs> Diego sent me a message and says, I'd love a 3 a.m. live session. Well, having done a 3 a.m. live session once very badly, uh, I would say you probably don't, but <laughs> we're, we do our best for the ones in the civilized time of day. So, cool. Yep. Um, I think um, while we're out there as well, just a, a point, we, we mentioned the iPad mm -hmm. stuff. We will be using the iPad as much as we can, um, yeah. in part to to push it. Uh, mm -hmm. We want to see um, as well what, what we can get away with. Yeah. Um, and that's a, that's a genuine workflow. So what we're talking about is, as you saw, we, we're going to be operating with mobile networks. So I want mm -hmm. to be in a place where we're shooting, we're uploading onto the iPad. We, we're not tethering yet. It's not no. quite 
um, ready, but it, that's on its way, obviously, oh. and people have talked about that. But we can put it onto the iPad, and we can edit on the go. So we've got some big, chunky drives in that yep. in that itinerary. During those drives, we should get to the place where every shot that I've taken is already uploaded, already rated, checked, exactly. flagged, um, ready to continue when we get back to base. And that's what we'll bring to you um, when we yep. do the broadcast. Which is the, the boring stuff, really. That's the least attractive part of doing any kind of photography, I find. Um, is is picking the shot. So if you can do that sitting in the back of a car, um, you know, on a great screen that, that the iPad has, and then have that ready and waiting for you when you're ready to pull it back down from the cloud, that's that's fantastic. You know, yes, um, I might just pick three or four that I know I want to edit for the next live session or whatever, but that's still a huge time saving from having to do that whole operation. Uh, yeah. importing cards, picking and so on, uh, when really you probably just want to lie down for a bit or get something to eat or whatever. So why not use the, the downtime, which is the whole point of having an application like Capture One for iPad. So, um, um, Just oh, as a reference, Paul has just said he hopes that our flight still goes. I can assure you, Paul, that we are not <laughs> on any of the airlines that are currently having difficulties. <laughs> yes, quite. <laughs> Yeah, there's a few of those around. Yeah. Oh, and also speaking of flying, uh, you've also got some nice drone kit to bring with us as well, haven't you? Yeah, we're going to play with the new toys. New toys. Uh, the little there we go. mini things. Um, yeah. So normally we take bigger kit um, to fly drone stuff out there, but mm -hmm. given that we've got a few of them, um, we're going to play with some funky little mini three pros um, yeah. and see what they can do. Because apparently they're now capable of doing 48 megapixel raw files. So Interesting. We'll try so and edit one of them. And flying where it's only legally allowed, of course, before, yes. before um, anyone else. So yeah. a lot of yeah, a lot of people um, miss this with Iceland. So um, there are national parks and also nature reserves um, where flying is banned without a permit, and those permits are regardless of whether you're commercial or recreational. So you can apply for a permit um, mm -hmm. to to fly recreationally, but. Um, you can't just whack up a drone over one of the national parks and do it, despite the volume of content that you may see out there. <laughs> Quite. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Well, thanks for joining us uh, um, this afternoon, uh, Paul, and also people watching uh, to hear about uh, what stupid stuff we're going to do next week. Um, and as I said, don't forget to join us live as well. Uh, we're probably also going to throw in a competition a bit later as well. Uh, to win a large format print. So keep an eye out on our channels for that, so from this trip. So if you're not subscribed to YouTube or Instagram or Facebook, uh, subscribe to those channels, uh, and then that way you'll hear about um, the competition that's going to come forward as well. And then you can win a nice big print. So more on that as we go through the week and next week. So thanks again, Paul, for joining us. Catch you later. And we'll see everyone soon. So take care. Bye now.